Got my head bobbing there for a minute. How many papas we have here this morning? How many dads do we have? I want to invite you dads to stand up for a second. Come on, men. Yeah. Just stay standing, if you will, for a second. Before I jump into my message, I feel like the enemy for a long time has been targeting fathers, trying to take them out of the picture. It's so beautiful for me this morning to look out and see some of my friends, all of you guys are church family here, our brothers that are loving their kids well, that are leading their families well. So today, we just want to honor you dads, and I just want to pray, before I even get started, a prayer of blessing over you guys today. Father, I thank you for the men and the families and the children that are represented in this room. I pray, God, that in the days to come that you would strengthen the hearts of the men, the dads here today, that they would lead their families well, that they would lead their children well well, that you would give them fresh vision for their home. You would strengthen them and protect their relationships with their wives and their children, Father. We thank you for these men today. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated. Well, I want to welcome you to week four of our message series entitled, This Is Us, where we've been sharing stories of personal transformation and stories on how we can all become better followers of Jesus Christ. About 10 years ago, my life was in a great place. I owned a barber shop in North Denver, a little business there. Shar had just graduated from grad school. She started practicing medicine. And can I just say, I seriously, when I married my wife, I seriously married up like 10 levels, I tell you. We had a four-year-old, Isaiah. Caleb was one years old. And things were great. We were going from place to place. We were leading worship. We spent all of our free time leading worship in other churches in the Denver area. And one weekend, as we were traveling around doing itinerant worship, we get a call from this mobile church that was meeting at a school out of all places, in reunion. And intrigued by this, they'd asked if we'd come out to do some worship. We came out and led worship once, and it went pretty good. And the next uh, Monday came about, and they reached out, and Mark reached out again and said, hey, man, we loved what you did last week. Is there any possibility that you'd come back and do it again? And we came back, and we did it again. And eventually, Mark extended an opportunity for uh, my, my family to, to accept this, uh, to, to take this vacant worship uh, role that was here at the church. Now, initially, we were excited about all the possibilities. After all, since I was young, I knew that God had called me to lead worship. Um, and I knew that he'd called me to lead ministry full time, but knowing what God had called me to do and actually doing it, well, those, that was two different things there. And it was going to require us to step out in ways that we had never done before. It was going to require us to step out in ways and walk in a level of faith like we had never done before. Joining the team here at the church meant giving up freedom of running my own business. It meant giving up the ministry that we held so near and dear to our hearts, all to walk into something that was very unknown. And can I just say and be very vulnerable with you guys this morning, that produced a lot of fear in my life, in my wife's life, in our family. Produced fear of not being qualified enough, fear that the job would be too big, or fear that the church would would fall apart and, and I would be left jobless. And I was looking through my future through the lens of fear and not what God had promised and not what God had purposed for my life. Now, I'm not going to ask you by a show of hands, but has any of you ever found yourself in that place? Can you identify with me 
where you are fearful or you're afraid to try something new. In your heart, you believe that God has called you to more than what you're doing, but fear has stopped you dead in your tracks. Today, we're going to try and find out how we can move past the fear that's holding us back, and we can have faith to step into the next season of our life and what God has promised for our life. Today, we're going to look at a generation who paid the price when they chose to obey fear over faith. When we go back into the Bible, we read the story of Israel and God had spoken to a man by the name of Abraham, and he says, Abraham, I want you to leave your country, and I want you to go to the land that I will show you. And God makes this bold promise to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Abraham, I'm going to make your name great and give you as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Now, that's a pretty big promise, right? Keep in mind, guys, Abraham had no GPS. He had no Google Maps. How many husbands here? Could you imagine looking at your wife one day and telling your wife, hey, honey, God is calling us somewhere in you, but yeah, you know what? I don't know exactly where he's calling us, and I don't know exactly when we're going to get there. How many husbands know that wouldn't go over so well? So Abraham leaves on this adventure to find the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land that God promised him. But here's the thing, before Abraham or his descendants would even get there, there was a severe famine that, ca- that caused Abraham's descendants to move into Egypt. And while they were there, his family started growing and growing and growing just as God said they would, and ultimately they become a threat to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians who were led by Pharaoh at this point, they get all of them rounded up, and they make them their slaves. Now could you imagine how the descendants of Abraham felt? Just imagine they knew what God had promised them, yet they become enslaved to Pharaoh, and they're there stuck in Egypt for over 430 years, generation after generation And all the while, stuck in the back of their minds, they're still waiting for this so-called promised land that God had promised their great-great-grandfather Abraham. So after 400 years of being captive slaves, God finally follows through on his promise, and he raises up a man by the name of Moses. Moses eventually leads his people out of Egypt across the Red Sea, and he finally leads them right up into the edge of the land that God had promised. Let's pick up the story right there. Numbers 13, 1 through 3. The Lord now said to Moses, Moses, send out 12 men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. See, here's the the funny thing. The problem with the promised land was there was already people living there. And if the Israelites were going to occupy the land that God had promised them, they would have to take it by force. So Moses here does what any good military leader would do. He sends out scouts to check it out, to check out the land, to survey the land, to check out the opposition, to see what they're going up against. And Moses sends 12 spies into the land that God already promised them. But these spies, they weren't just any regular people. They were all leaders from their respected tribes. And because of this, they had influence over decisions that were being made and the weight of what they said it carried with Moses. So after 40 days of spying, they come back and they bring this report. Let's continue on in Numbers 13, 27. It says, we entered the land you sent us to explore. And indeed, it's a bountiful country. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. So they bring back this 
They cut off a vine from a branch with these grapes that are about the size of watermelons, if you can just imagine that. And they bring it back to show Moses what was in the land. It was everything that God said it would be. It was beautiful. There was plenty of space. The soil was good. The food was good. Let's continue on in Numbers 13, 28. But the people living there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. See, all 12 spies agreed with what they had seen. They agreed what they had experienced. The land was great. But there were these fortified walls, and not all 12 spies agreed on how to proceed, how to move forward. Has any of you ever been on a team where you're trying to make a decision or pass an initiative and you can't move it forward? You know how frustrating that is? So they're bickering back and forth. They're arguing back and forth. Even if we get past the walls, how are we going to fight the giants in the land? As I was doing some research for my message, I actually came across a picture with one of the small spies that Moses sent in uh, on his journey with, uh, with some of the giants there in the land. <laughs> I was taken back at the school. There were some big men. Can you recognize some of those guys there? <laughs> so they all disagreed on how to approach the situation. And Numbers 13, 30 continues to read on. It says, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. He said, Let's go at once and take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. See, two of the spies that were with the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they believed that God had called them to take the land. And they had enough faith in God that God would make good on his promise. They were like, come on, guys, let's go. We can do this. But the other ten spies were all gripped by fear. Numbers 13, 31 continues on, and it says, but the other men who had explored the land with them disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report, spreading fear about the land to the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. You see, it was God's idea. It was God's idea to send the scouts into the land. And they came back with this unified report, but very different Ideas on how to move forward. And what I think is one of the most disturbing passages in Scripture kind of goes on to talk about how Moses, at this point, he makes a leadership decision that would end up costing him and a whole generation to miss out on what God had promised. Moses here chooses to listen to the ten doubtful Fearful spies instead of the two who were seeing things through the lens of faith. You see, Moses, he let fear hold him back. He let fear hold him back from God's promise to Abraham. He chose fear over faith and it cost them 40 years of wondering before they would even take possession of what God had for them. You see, that's how fear works. Fear stops us dead in our tracks. It holds us back from the promises and the, the things that God has promised in our lives. It holds us back from those very things. So how does fear hold us back? My first point is this. Is fear makes us compare ourselves to others. You see, the Israelites, they looked at the people occupying the land, and they felt like they didn't measure up. 
The people lived in these fortified towns. They were taller, they were stronger, they were better warriors. And as they compared themselves to their opponents, they began to believe that they were inferior, that they were less than, that they didn't measure up because that's what fear does to us. Fear alters the perception of how we see ourselves. And through the lens of fear, we perceive ourselves as grasshoppers. But church, can I tell you that when we look through the lens of how Jesus sees us, we actually are like giants. And the world is like grasshoppers. When we compare ourselves to others, to what they possess, intimidation will replace confidence. The text actually goes on and it says that the scouts did not only feel like they were grasshoppers there, but the giants perceived them. That way as well. And the spies became became overly focused on the perceptions of others and the contrast in their physical size, and they forgot what God had promised them. Can I just say that one of the biggest things that worship leaders struggle with, one of the biggest things that we struggle with is comparison. We compare ourselves to others all the time. There's always someone who sings better. There's always someone who plays better. There's always someone who has a bigger team, who wears skinnier ripped jeans with jean jackets and jewelry and tattoos all over. We always compare ourselves to others. But comparison is something we all struggle with in different areas of our lives. When I first came to Landing Place Church, one of my best friends, many of you know him, his name is Andy Garcia, and he was leading worship here at the time. Many of you know Andy up there. Andy is one of our missionaries, and those of you who have heard Andy sing know that Andy has the vocal range of Mariah Carey. Andy's the Mexican male version of Mariah Carey. (laughs) Andy is... Trust me, guys, I got his permission because... I, he would got me fired real quick. <laughs> Andy's performed on the biggest stages in front of thousands and thousands of people. God gives him favor with producers and songwriters and leaders and record labels and worship leaders and so on. So stepping in for Andy, it was an honor. It was a privilege. But when I begin to compare myself to how experienced Andy was, how talented Andy was, how gifted he was, it produced this fear inside of me of not being quite good enough. Maybe I'm not quite talented enough. Can I tell you that comparison? It almost held me back from walking into what God had purposed for my life here at Landing Place Church. I almost quit, guys, before I even started. In fact, I was two weeks in, and I came up to Mark, and I sat in, the, in his office across from him, and I said, you know what, I, I can't do this. I think I'm going to quit. He's like, really? Already? It's only two weeks. <laughs> I just say that I believe God is inviting all of us here to step into a next level of obedience. He may be leading some of you to move up in your job. He may be wanting to bless you financially so you can impact the kingdom. He may be asking you to step up here at church and maybe start leading a small group or hop in and mentor and pour into kids in Kids Link. But fear of comparison has been holding you back. Like, you know what, I don't think I can do that because what I've seen other people do, I can't do that. But I believe God is calling all of us today to step into Something new, a new promise, a new adventure. And I want to encourage us all today that we don't want to quit before we even start like the spies did. They, they were defeated before they even started. I want to encourage us today to not let the size of someone's gift intimidate us like the Israelites did. Just because someone seems more gifted in a particular area, remember that God's purpose doesn't require us to be fully gifted. See, the giant, the the Israelites, they weren't giants, but God didn't need their physical strength. 
God needed their hearts. He needed willing hearts. And can I tell you today, here at Landing Place Church, that's all God is looking for, some willing hearts to step in and say, yeah, Jesus, I'll go. Point two is fear causes us to focus on the negative. There were so many good things that were happening in the land, and it wasn't that they didn't see it. They all came back with a very unified report how amazing the land was, but their focus quickly shifted from how amazing it was and how positive, the, the positive aspects of it to all of the negative things. Have you ever noticed how quickly negativity spreads? Have you ever had a conversation with someone or heard a conversation or been a part of a conversation where someone is saying something negative about a situation or perhaps about somebody? And all of a sudden you leave the conversation and as you're on your day, the rest of your day, you're processing the words of what the thing that were being said or the, 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 the situation that was being talked about. And all of a sudden your perception of the person or the situation that was being talked about has shifted? That's what happens. That's how fast negativity can spread. Have you ever noticed that negativity gets more press than positive news? We've all seen that over the last few years. Even the weather is described as partly cloudy as, as opposed to almost sunny. See, to possess what God has promised for our lives, we need to shut out the fearful voices. We need to shut out the negative voices that are around us. Something I find very interesting is that Moses knew God. Moses knew God personally. He met with God on the mountain. He received the Ten Commandments. He, he, and when he came down from the experience, he was with God so much, he even glowed from being in his presence. See, Moses wasn't just someone who heard God, but he knew God. And even Moses succumbed to the negative voices that were around him. He let the doubters' voices be louder than the voice of God. If we're going to resist negativity, we must be like Caleb. We must refuse to adopt the attitudes of those around us. Caleb and Joshua, they saw things the other scouts, they saw the same thing the other scouts did, but their response was completely different. They weren't focused on the negative things uh, that, was, that were there in the promised land. They were focused on the positive things. They weren't focused on the big scary people. They were focused on what God had promised for them. Point three, this fear affects those around us. Once they got the report, it spread like wildfire. And before you knew it, the information was passed from the spies to Moses and then from Moses down into the whole community. And now Moses wasn't just dealing with some fearful leaders. He's dealing with a whole community of fearful, doubtful people. I had surgery a few months back. And the fear that I was facing before the surgery, I was a wuss. <laughs> I was so afraid. I was paralyzed by fear. I was unable to get control over my thoughts. I was afraid of the anesthesia. I was worried about not healing right. I was worried about physical therapy. I was worried about everything. You could ask the staff. Every staff meeting, it was 20 minutes of praying over Beto and his fear. <laughs> And one day I had the big bright idea to reach out to my big brother, Eugene. He's my older brother. He happened to have the same exact surgery I did. So I said, bro, how was it? And he says, oh, my God. <laughs> I could just see his eyes getting all big. Oh, my God, over the phone. It was so bad. The pills got me so messed up. I could not sleep. Uh, it hurt my shoulder. Then the physical therapy was worse than the surgery itself. He goes on to say, you can ask any woman that's had the surgery. It's worse than giving childbirth. He fed me so much fear. <laughs> Finally, one day, Charlene says, enough. <laughs> it's 
stop talking to your brother for a few weeks. Baby, you need to start talking to Jesus. I'm telling you guys, I seriously married up here. She says, you need to stop talking to your brother for a few weeks. If you keep feeding yourself with fear, that's what's going to reproduce inside of you. She said, honey, you need to trust God that everything's going to be okay because your attitude is going to affect your healing. The fact that there were giants and fortified cities was enough to cause the whole community to lose sight of the promise of God. The, The promise of God. The problem was is they started listening to each other. And they became infected with fear and with doubt and the consequences for the fear and the comparison. And being overly focused on all the negative things, it affected them all. And half of that, actually all of the generation before Caleb, they didn't even make the land that God had promised to them. But what I love What I love about this story is that there were two spies that were different. There was a Caleb and there was a Joshua. And they were the only men from their generation that were permitted to go into the promised land. And you know why? It's because they had hearts that trusted in Jesus. Caleb and Joshua, they didn't have an earthly perspective. They had a kingdom perspective. Continues to read on in Numbers 14, and it says, But my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others has. He's remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land that he explored, and his descendants will possess their full share of the land. See, Caleb's attitude was one of loyalty and devotion to the Lord. His spirit was bold and tenacious. Caleb knew that if God had promised them the land, there was no giant that would be too big to have them not occupy it. There was no walls too tall that they would not go through because Caleb trusted in what God's word said and what God promised them. He understood no matter how big the giants were, No matter how much stronger they would be, nothing would prevent them from the victory that they would later taste when Joshua leads them into the promised land. See, this message isn't just about fear and how fear works. It's about something greater than fear. It's about faith. It's about faith to trust in God and what He has promised for your life it's faith to trust him with the giants that you're facing in your life it's faith to trust him that he'll get you over the walls it's faith to trust him in a bad diagnosis or a failing marriage it's not about fear it's about trusting in him and my prayer is that we would be a people that would have the character traits of Caleb and Joshua. This morning, God is looking for some people that are full of the power of the Holy Spirit like Caleb and Joshua, willing to stand against fear and take what he has promised for our lives. That's what he's looking for today. Heather talked last week that we have an enemy who wants to keep us in fear so we don't move forward in faith. And he'll do whatever it takes to make us feel inadequate. He'll do whatever it takes to keep us focused on the negative. He'll tell us whatever message we need to hear to keep us stuck in fear. I've always known what God had for my life. From a young age, I knew that God had called me to lead worship, and I I had a big family. My mom was one of 16 kids, and we had a, literally had hundreds, like 100 cousins. And there wasn't one day of the week where, on the summertime, where we would have four or five of my cousins with us. I remember from a young age, nine, 10 years old, I would gather my cousins in my basement. We had a pool table 
down there and I would take that pool table over and I would stand on that pool table and I would preach and I would sing to my cousins. I would lay hands on them and we would pray for each other and we would have church. Most kids, they want to be firefighters, police officers, or doctors. Not me. I always wanted to be a pastor. I always wanted to sing. If I would have let that fear, if I would have let comparison hold me back, I would have never been able to experience all that God had for me here at this church. If Mark Hardacre would have never went on a journey, however many years ago it was, 15 years ago, like Abraham, go to this city I'm going to send you to, I would have never had the opportunity to lead here. If I would have never shown up, I would have never had the opportunity to pour into Josh or Julia or some of the other worship leaders that are being raised up. See, what we need to understand this morning is that when we refuse to step out, it doesn't only impact our lives, but it impacts the people's lives that we could potentially impact when we choose to say yes to Jesus and no to fear. This morning, I believe some of you here today are at a place of decision, feeling like God has made you more than what, for, than what you're doing right now. There's something greater that He has, and you just don't know what it is yet. I pray that you would seek Him this morning. Figure out what it is and not let fear hold us back. I wanna invite you to just close your eyes for a moment. Um, Too high of a key, go lower. Keep going lower, too high. (laughs) Just stop playing for a second. I wanna sing a song over you. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing that with me. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. God, I pray that we would be a people that aren't held back by fear any longer. I pray that we would be a people, God, of faith. That we would trust in you, God, with our futures. That we would have the courage it takes, God, to step out into new adventures, into new things, because you're with us. I pray, God, for those that feel like they might be too old or that you've overlook them or that it's too late or they didn't have a promised land. I pray today that you would begin to stir new things in people's hearts today. We thank you, God, for your word this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.